Yeah. Say I say something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the, the uh, opportunity to come here and give this presentation. Um, as you notice, in the original schedule, there was a talk from Frank Maas uh, schedule now, but he's ill, so he couldn't come. So as a birthday present, the organizers uh, told me that I must speak longer than in the anticipated time. <laughs> Uh, but Frank Maas did send me his slides uh, yesterday afternoon, asked me to include some of it, so I have been trying to merge some of his slide into my talk without losing too much of, of the red line. Okay, so this is a talk about, primarily about prospect of hyperphysics with Panda. Uh, so, as you all know, Panda experiment is a fair, fairly large collaboration. And we hope to see a Brazilian flag also on, on this slide in the near, within not too far uh, distant future. Okay, so, and what I will do, uh, I, I will focus uh, on what we can do with Panda when the P-bars uh, become available not what you can do in four or five years where you have the full blown intensity, but rather than what we can we do day, day one. And when it comes to hyperons, I would like to review what do we know from experiments today and what new information can Panda provide. And I will also try to explain why Hyperon, I, I mean, hyperons can be produced in many processes, but what's so special about uh, anti-hyperon, hyperon two-body processes, and I'll try, try to explain that. And, but I will add a few slides uh, based on uh, Frank uh, Maas on, on uh, electromagnetic processes. It has some bearing to what I want to say also. So, <clears throat> get the basics. So, if you want to understand an, an object, uh, oh, uh, what you can do? Well, you can scatter on it and uh, analyze the, the, the scattering. You can excite it and study the, the excited states. Or you can replace one of the building blocks and, and see how the system responds to that. And all these things, three things, are relevant for the, the hyperon case. Now, so, the question to be asked is how are baryon structure in interaction affected when you replace a light quark by a heavier one? And in my talk, I will primarily talk uh, on strange hyperons. So we are probing the QCD in the confinement domain uh, here. Uh, Charmed uh, hyperons are also available at, uh, at uh, Panda, but I will not discuss so much uh, on that. But everything I say um, is, uh, can be translated into charmed hyperons. It's just that you probe another length scale. Okay. And furthermore, the cross sections are, are much higher for strange hyperons, so that's what the focus will be um, uh, at the start of, of, of the panda. Now, I, I would like to explain to you why I think the hyperons are really a good laboratory to, to study strong interactions, physics, and also barrier structures. So we use hyperons as diagnostic tools. So the question we will ask is, 
how do they interact? What are the structure? And what symmetries can we investigate? And the observables we have there is the production processes, form factors, spectroscopy, and, and decay studies. And taking a look at the energy range available at uh, the high energy storage ring for antiprotons, you see that uh, we can cover everything from the lambda strange uh, hyperon up to the omega c. So strange and, and charmed hyperons are accessible at, at, for studies at HESR uh, and Panda. Now, an antiproton proton annihilation is an excellent entrance channel to produce uh, hyperons because they're produced via the strong interaction, which means that they are, they are relatively high cross sections. And if you take just a quark line diagram picture, if you produce a lambda lambda bar, what um, in, a, in a constituent quark model, you have one U deep uh, pair is a spin isospin zero di quark, and you annihilate a U quark and create an S, uh, SS, S quark. For the cascade zero, you would, in such a picture, you would annihilate the diquark rather. And, um, and of course, for an omega, you have a complete annihilation between the initial and, and the final state uh, quark systems. So <coughs> these studies are very well suited to study at the Panda. And uh, the detector. I will not, uh, this is the only detector picture I will show. It, it, it will be covered by Tassos uh, in a talk later on. Now, what do we know? Well, we know total cross sections. Uh, the threshold region for single strangeness production was relatively well measured at Lear, the low energy antiproton ring, which Hulrich also talked about. And it's an experiment called PS185. So you can see that this is the onset of the cross section. And, but the, there was a limitation at Lear that it couldn't go above 2 GV over C momentum. So all data points here without arrow bars for lambda, la, bar, lambda bar lambda and lambda bar sigma are from, from Lear. The one with arrow bars are from other experiments. But uh, there's also a change of scale. So if you look at the high energy, high momentum range, uh, uh, first of all, uh, is this pointer? Yeah. Uh, is there, there are no data available at all. This is completely un uncharted territory. These are just legends. And when it comes to double strange uh, cascades, these are the, the squares. These are bubble chamber measurements, uh, which have handful events, typically six, seven, eight events. So you have an idea about the cross section, but nothing else. So there's a lot of things that can be learned. So <clears throat> once again, the threshold region was pretty well mapped out uh, by PS185 at Lear. But there are only a handful omega omega bar event for bubble chambers, and otherwise, multiple strains and charged hyperons in these two body channels are completely unknown. So, there is really a window of opportunity for Panda. I could also mention that integrating all lambda lambda bar events taken at the layer by PS25 constitutes about 200,000 events. I'll come back to that later. But have you, have you learned anything from this? Well, there are, there are a few things I'd like to, two things I'd like to point out. First, if you take a look at the threshold region, here is the threshold scan, a beautiful scan. Please note the scale. I, I, I prefer to use excess energy rather than center mass energy. Excess energy is simply the center mass energy minus the mass of, of the final state particle, so the threshold is at zero. 
And you see, the cross section is perfectly mapped out down to the threshold. And it beautifully also uh, reflects phase space behavior. So this is S wave, which goes, which goes as to the excess energy to the power one half. And, uh, but here you see the S wave undershoots, so here, here P waves come in already at one MeV above threshold. So P waves, but the smooth behavior tells you also there's no sign of resonances because, for example, there had been speculation that there would be sub-threshold uh, lambda lambda bar bound states predicted, and, and there is no sign of, of this at all in, in, in the data. Sorry. Of the total cross section, is P to lambda lambda. What is the what's the relative branch interaction? How? Com compared to what? Total branch interaction. Oh. Well, the total cross section is the uh, order of millibars. It's uh, a hundred millibars, if I remember right, and and this is uh, ten of, of microbars. But. Uh, I will comment later on why it's so easy to, to extract these channels. Okay. Another thing worth pointing out is uh, PS105 also measured the charged uh, sigmas cross section at one energy. And they found that, uh, or we found, I was, I was part of that experiment. That, uh, that the cross section of sigma plus and sigma minus are pro approximately the same. And this is a contrast to what you uh, naively would expect because producing a sigma plus, you only annihilate uh, one quark in, in the initial states, whereas you, for a sigma minus, you annihilate two quarks. So this is an, uh, seems to be an OZI rule violation, which tells you as a rule of thumb that a process is. Uh, for each uh, disconnected uh, quark line, uh, the probability or cross section should drop by an order of magnitude. So why is that? Well, this is relatively close to threshold, so it could be a couple channel effect, perhaps, because uh, so you, 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 the process goes via an intermediate uh, lambda lambda bar state. And in fact, if you look at uh, the data at uh, uh, almost at eight GVs. You see, the two cross sections differ by one order of magnitude, exactly like you would expect. So it's likely a couple channel effect, but uh, nobody, as far as I know, has uh, looked into this uh, and, and uh, made any predictions about this. Okay, there's so much about total cross section. What about differential cross sections? They are forward peaked. And that you can naively understand also if you come in with a proton and you annihilate one of the quarks, you have a leading particle effect of the die quarks, which will uh, provide you a forward peaking. And this holds also for sigma zero and, and, uh, and charge sigmas. It's interesting to plot the, the uh, differential cross section as, as uh, T prime, that's uh, the reduced four momentum squared. So it's, it's uh, Four momentum transfer minus the mass of the particles. So, and so this is the low energy. So here you see the phase space rising. But then, all data line up all the way out here. There are two different slopes, but otherwise the data shows a very remarkably consistent picture. And this is in contrast to higher energy where at 6 GVOC, the cross-section falls up of more, much more than uh, at the lower energies. Whereas the forward rise, this book, they, they, they seem to align. And why that is, uh, it's not really understood. It, I mean, you have more in, in elastic channels available here, so this is probably an effect of that. But um, OK. Now, let me say a few words about observables. If you have two one-half spin particles in the initial state and two one-half 
particles in, in the spin one half in the, in the final state and take polarization into account. There is a, you can measure differential cross section polarization asymmetries uh, and spin correlation and polarization transfer. And if you sum up all the, this, you actually end up with 256 uh, variables to, to total, completely describe such a process. Now, nature is kind. So if you take symmetries into account, because this is a strong interacting process, so, so if you take into account parity conservation, charge conjug conjugation, um, variance, and some geometrical in identities, this uh, 256 observables boils down to 40 independent observables. Eight of them are measurable with unpolarized beam and target. And 24 are measurable if you have a polarized uh, target. Now, how, how do you measure spin observables? Well, the beauty of a lambda particle is that it is a self-analyzing. It's a polarizer because uh, it decays via the, non, via the weak interaction. So if, if you look at the, put yourself in the, in the rest frame of the lambda, the proton from the proton pi minus decay with respect to the uh, normal or the scattering plane has a, a slope given by the asymmetry parameter and times the polarization. So it, it is, you get the polarization for free when you analyze the, 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 your data. And polar, polarization is, is a very strong um, uh, filter to understand the, the process. Uh, I like this uh, illustration because if you can have, have a measure polarization and filter out polarization, the picture becomes much more cleaner and clearer. Okay. Now, so what you do in, 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 in this case is that you, since you measure both lambda and lambda, lambda bar, you not only measure the polarization, but you also measure spin correlations. Here, Zx, Z and Z, C, Zx uh, are, should be identical, so that, therefore they put on the same line. So this is uh, straightforward to, to analyze, uh, and, and you get information from that. Now, you need an asymmetry parameter uh, to, 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 to be able to measure polarization. And if you take a look at the, the hyperons, uh, those with a large asymmetry parameter where you have polarization measurements uh, accessible are the lambda, charge, sigmas, cascade, uh, and uh, the lambda C. Another thing worth noticing is uh, that, um, and that's what, what makes it relatively easy to, to, to extract hyperons from, from background, is that they are relatively long-lived. Uh, long so the, this, this is given by the C tau. So if you multiply this number by the relativistic gamma, you get the average distance traveled by the particle before it decays. So we're talking about centimeters. So. And also, <coughs> uh, for a multiple strange uh, system, you have a lambda uh, also in, in the subsequent uh, decays. So these are our values given in the PDG 2018. And the polarization itself, it comes from interference between uh, different partial waves in the final state. So here are examples for threshold measurements of, of uh, polarizations. Now, it's interesting to look at the polarization uh, as a function of, of uh, the energy. The differential cross-sections, they more or less line up. Polarization does not. Uh, it shows much more... Uh, a much more uh, vivid uh, behavior. So this is excess, excess excitation energy, or how far you're away from threshold. 
This is in principle the angular distribution. This is, this is polarization. So you see, you have a. a it, it develops um, as you go up in, in energy. So this shows you that uh, the the uh, interference between the final states uh, really makes up uh, a, a pattern which is uh, dynamical. Now. How, how do we understand that? Well, there was a lot of theory effort during the time of Lear because data was produced. And primarily, they were based on a constituent quark model uh, lined up here at the left, or a Mason exchange models, where you exchange 1k on for, for each uh, number of, of strangeness. And they, they, these models uh, were quite successful in, in uh, describing the data. Uh, here are examples for this called quark inspired model, differential cross section, polarization, and thin correlation. And these are Mason exchange models, which also give a decent. But uh, to me, there is a word of warning. Some theorists in this business are, are, were not. Uh, happy by making this statement, but the point is that, uh, that you have to include initial state interaction and final state interaction in your calculation. And in particular for the lambda-lambda bar system, uh, essentially nothing is known, so there's a lot of freedom of tuning the parameters uh, in the potential, giving the, the um, final state interaction, and, and by tuning these parameters, you, you can get a, a reasonable description to the data. And uh, this is a, uh, <coughs> there's an overview article here uh, which describes this in more detail. Now, spin correlations, on the contrary, show the same pattern as, as a differential cross-second. They seem to line up. Uh, as a fu function of, of the reduced four momentum uh, squared. And that's interesting because you can, from the spin correlation, you can extract uh, what's called the singlet fraction, which is the expectation value of the spin orientation between the final state uh, hyperon, uh, lambda. So this, this should be value, is, this value is one if the, the lambdas are in a singlet state Zero if they are in triplet state, and uh, should be 0.25 if uh, there's a statistical distribution. And looking at the data on lambda lambda bar, you see they all line up at zero for all, all energies. So this means that the lambda lambda bar or the SS bar are produced with parallel spin. This is not the case for the sigma lambda. There you have much, much more uh, statistical distribution. And you, can, uh, could, you could um, understand this in, in, in this naive picture that you have a diquark spin out spin spare zero, so you have the, this is given by the, the, the strange, uh, uh, anti strange uh, production. Whereas for the sigma, the diquark is in as a spin one state, spin one state, so the, the situation is more complicated. And <clears throat> so I think that it's fair to say that the, the parallel spins are related to the production mechanism. And this can actually be understood in this uh, quark model inspired models, you have either a one gluon exchange, and if you have one gluon exchange, you have a triple S uh, vertex for the SS bar. So automatically you get a triplet state. And if you have a two gluon exchange, you have a triplet P vertex. So you also naturally get a, a triplet state. What about this Mason exchange models? Well, in fact, to get a good description of, of the data, it's not enough to just exchange a, a K plus. You, you have to add a, a transit transition. And um, including a K star two exchange, you have the spin flip involved, and that also induces a triplet spin. I would like to make a few remarks uh, 
on on um, on uh, what you can learn by by measuring with the polarized target because that was done at layer. That was done <coughs> with a transverse uh, polarized target, proton target. So you, in addition to the scattering angle, decay angle of, of the proton in the lambda rays frame, you have also the angle phi, which is the proton polar target polarization with respect to the scattering plane. So you have access uh, to all the, these uh, I, I will not bother with the detail, but I just want to point out uh, two observables which is of interest. The DYY, which tells you how the polarization is transferred from the proton to lambda, and the K, which gives you the polarization transfer from the proton to the anti-lambda. And the reason why this was done was that these mod the Mason exchange models and and uh, and uh, Quark uh, inspired more, give different predictions. So this is what I did, that maybe you can tell which, uh, which one, which picture is the more relevant one. Uh, so here you have data. Unfortunately, as always, uh, the data are right in between the predictions. So in fact, there is no DYY, is a spin transfer from the proton to lambda. There seems to be no spin transfer from uh, the proton to the lambda. Whereas the KYY shows a correlation or of 0.75 uh, in the backward direction. So there seems to be spin transfer from the proton to the anti-lambda. And at least I don't understand this, but uh, this is what the data tells you. Uh, and another thing worth noticing is that um, you can write down the matrix, uh, transition matrix, and uh, <coughs> in, a, in a small general, most general form in terms of spin operators. And this uh, brings the matrix down to six complex amplitudes, which are functions of the scattering angle, and they contain the dynamics of the reaction. I told you, you, me you can measure 24 observables, and, and this matrix uh, only contains 12 uh, or 11 real numbers and an arbitrary phase. So you have actually more observables than uh, unknowns in this case. So you can do um, the fit of, of, of this, uh, of, of this um, uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> parameters A, B, uh, and, and determine them. And then you can use relations to actually give uh, data on things that you don't can measure. So you can measure, complete, uh, determine the, the scattering matrix. And to my knowledge, this is the only experiment that has pinned down all the matrix elements in, in, in a reaction. So here's an, an example uh, of, of unmeasured extracted uh, uh, spin correlation. So here, for example, you have rank four observables. Which I find quite remarkable. One one remark I would like to do, uh, but to comment during this analysis, that for some of those observables, there was a tendency to get unphysical values of, of these correlations, which could have could be fixed uh, if a, a symmetry parameter was, was larger than the 0.64 given by the PDG. Now, the one last word about uh, uh, spin observables. If you have a multiple strange uh, hyperons such as a cascade, that decays then into a lambda pi, and then the lambda decay is the p pi. So, in, if you look at the Cascade race frame, you have the same situation as for the lambda decay, that the, you measure the polarization of the cascade as the slope of, of the, the lambda angle in the rest frame of the cascade uh, modulus uh, the asymmetry parameter of, of, of the alpha. But you also measure the, the alpha decay, alpha, sorry, the lambda decay as well. And uh, I, I will not bother you uh, 
uh, with the, the coordinate system. The point uh, I want to make is that uh, in this system, you are not only sensitive to the alpha parameter, but you're also sensitive to what's called beta and, and the gamma. And these asymmetry parameters, they come from the interference of the SMP wave of, of the hyper decay. So the alpha is given by the real part of, of the SP interference. Beta is, is given by the imaginary part of the SP interference. And why this is interesting is because these are observables you, you want to study if uh, to check for search for CP violation. And beta is expected to be much more sensitive to CP violation than, uh, than alpha. And so the uh, hyperon-antihyperon process is, is uh, suitable, very, very suitable to test CP invariance in the, in the barium sector, which has, uh, because if CP is conserved, the asymmetry parameters should be the same for particle and antiparticle, except for the sign. And presently, PDG has uh, a 2% uh, upper limit on, on the alpha from the lambda decay. There is a value which is 5 times 10 to the minus 3 from um, the Silex, I think, experiment, the formula, but they measured the, 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 the product of, of the asymmetric parameter of the cascade and, and the lambda. And uh, for fun, I, I took all the PS1 and the 5 data, um, 200,000 200, events, and you get the precision of or an upper limit of the order of 1.5%, or 1.4, 10 to the minus 2. Panda will provide much more statistics. Uh, here is an example of uh, simulations done for uh, Panda at 1.64 GV of C. And the reason why this uh, NE is chosen is that this is the um, data sample that would have this higher statistics from, from layer, So it's a good cross-check of, of the, of the uh, analysis. So you see that the polarization can be very well uh, reproduced. Here, here are spin correlations. There is a, a dip here uh, for this data point, but this um, particular point uh, re is reflected by um, a region in the detector which has very, very low acceptance. So this should be done with much, much higher statistics. This was done with 100,000 events. So the prospect for day one luminosity for uh, the different uh, channels for lambda, lambda bar. And now I'm talking about reconstructable events. Uh, you expect to get 30 of the order of 30 reconstructable events uh, per second. This means that you will collect 700,000 lambda lambda bar in one day. PS1, if I collected 200,000 uh, lambda lambda bar <coughs> events over, I don't remember how many, six or seven years. So this is Panda and the high energy storage ring at FERT will really be a strangeness factory. And also for uh, the cascades, you expect of the order of two uh, events per second. Uh, nothing is known about the cross section for omega and, and lambda c, but uh, in fact, the theoretical calculations vary by, be, between uh, two orders of magnitude, and this is the middle, uh, the, the middle of the value. And the fact that the events uh, consist, the topology is such that you have decay which are well displaced from the interaction vertex, it makes it very clean from, from background. Okay. So, to summarize that part, the weak interaction, a weak hyperon decay, give access to polarization and spin correlations. So you have access to spin degrees of freedom in strange and sharp uh, quark pair production. And you have many observables, so you, you will be able to do partial wave analysis of the data, which should be, provide um, 
high discrimination power also about for models, and you can do CP violation tests. Panda. <laughs> uh, few words about structure. I mean, um, Hyperstructure, well, you can't do so much uh, because you need the um, electromagnetic uh, uh, process there, but you can look uh, for transition form factors. For example, uh, sigma zero decaying into lambda, uh, virtual photon, and e plus e minus. This decay has never been observed. And uh, Predictions are in the range 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6. But uh, given that, that you will produce of the order of uh, 100,000 uh, events per day, you could eventually access uh, transition form factors. Which leads me into the electromagnetic uh, form factor. So this is a part of um, a Frank Mass talk, but uh, there, there are some things that are also relevant for the hyperon case. So, for <clears throat> the electromagnetic form factor uh, provides information about the, the spatial charge and magnetic distributions, magnetization distributions. And for a spin one half particle, you have two form factors. And this you measure either by doing electron scattering on, on a baryon, which the is uh, what you call a space-like region where the form factors are real. And you have the time-like region where the electromagnetic form factors are complex. So here, here panda comes into play. And you have then an uh, unphysical region below the, the, the two baryon masses. But there is hope that you can probe this by uh, looking at uh, P bar P goes to E plus E minus pi zero. And these regions should be, are connected with the dispersion relations, the dispersion relations. So the form factors uh, in one region should, it, at least in principle, uh, should be able to predict the, uh, the behavior in, in uh, the other region. So either you do that with an E plus E minus, and then you emit the virtual photon, and the form factor is then described by this ba an unknown baryon vertex. Or you have a proton-antiproton, which then the process simply goes from the left to the right. And uh, normally, you write down these form factors as an electric and magnetic form factors uh, with these uh, normalization factors. OK. Just one word about the space-like uh, form factors. Um, uh, they are normally they, they, uh, analyzed by the Rosenblatt separation. So you have the cross-section given by, by this expression, where this epsilon is uh, what's called uh, the, vert the virtual photon polarization. And you have a kinematic factor tau here, which depends on the four, four momentum squared. So what you do is that you define a red, reduced cross-section, which, which simply you, do, you divide the experimental cross-section with the MOT uh, cross-section and divide out the kinematical factors. And then you get the gm squared epsilon over tau ge squared. So you expect this cross-section to have a linear dependence on, on the, the virtual uh, pol the polarization of, of the virtual photon at a given Q squared with a slope that is proportional to GE, and the intercept is, given, is then given by GM. So you have to measure at many, many energies uh, and uh, plot the, uh, the many, <coughs> many Q squared and, and then plot the, this at a function of epsilon to, to extract this. Uh, and another thing which is also relevant for the time-like time uh, region is that this one over tau factor for the electric uh, one makes it very difficult to measure the electric uh, form factor at, at uh, high momentum transfers. And here is an example uh, of, of, for the proton. Um, there are 
good data for the space like region, but uh, for the time like region, the data are scarce. But there has been attempt to, to make a coherent analysis of this to, to get the, the charge and magnetic distribution for the proton. Okay. Now, this is a bit messy, but for the time like uh, differential cross section, uh, it's in the one photon exchange picture, which is a very, very good uh, approximation. It's given by, by this expression here. The point here, to, uh, which is important to notice, is it's sufficient to measure at one energy to, to get information about the, the moduli of GE and GM. This is given simply by the, by the differential cross section. And it's increasingly difficult to measure the also here due to this one over tau uh, behavior. Now, for the E plus, E minus, um, and also P by P, the cross sections are, are very low. So it's hard to get enough statistics to, 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 get, to do a uh, good angular distribution. That, therefore, one defines an effective form factor, which essentially is a, is a total cross section divided by, by this kinematical term. That's all there is, essentially. So it's the rewriting of total cross section <coughs> dividing up the kinematical term. And this is the world data on, on the time like uh, effective pro, uh, form factor shown here in, in this plot here. And one thing uh, worth pointing out the green points here are the, from Barbar experiment at SLAC. If you take a closer look at the data, and for some reason the Barbar didn't notice this, that um, if you make a dipole type of fit to the data, they seem, the data seems to oscillate around this. So if you dive up, divide out this uh, curve, you see an oscillatory pattern in the time-like uh, cross-section. Uh, why that is? Well, most likely some kind of interference effect. There will soon be released data also from BEST-3 on, on, on this matter, which um, I think will confirm this behavior. But it, it's an answering. Uh, but this was then essentially total cross-sections. If you want to measure the ratio between electric and magnetic form factor in time-like region, the data are very poor. I mean, a huge error bar. It's very hard to draw any conclusion. The main conclusion you can, can draw is that the inconsistency between data. These, the red points were taken at layer. P bar P goes to E plus E minus, whereas the, the green points are from bar bar. E plus E minus go to P P bar. So there is a discrepancy here which needs to be sorted out. And this can be done uh, also by, by Panda, and it has been shown that uh, that it can be extracted to a precision given by this, this arrow bar here. Uh, statistics will also be higher at, 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 at Panda for, for the P bar, P goes to E plus E minus. So you see here is predicted uh, size of the arrow bars from Panda compared to the E plus E minus. E plus E minus data. And um, you can also extend the, the uh, total cross sections uh, essentially up to higher momentum transfer with, with the Tanda. And a novelty in Tanda when it comes to that is you can not only measure E plus E minus, but also mu plus mu minus, which, which uh, has never been measured before. So you measure P bar P goes to mu plus mu minus, and then you can compare the uh, lepton univers universality, for example, between the two channels. And also for the ratio of GE to GM, uh, you Panda can make a much better job uh, than the published data at high momentum transfer. Day one would correspond to this uh, orange area. 
this one would be at the high luminosity part. Then you can extend this to very, very high regions. So to summarize this one, the time-like electromagnetic perform factors, a panda, will give the first measurement of neurons in final state. You can do consistency checks with the E plus E minus data, and you can cover a larger range of Q squared. What I didn't uh, cover in, in this talk, in this part of the talk, uh, which Frank Maus has, uh, is, is a hard exclusive process, but I will upload his, his transparencies uh, so for those who are interested, you can have a look at, at his talk. Now, I already said that the time like form factors are complex, and this is uh, due to the inelasticity, which introduces a, a relative phase between the electric and magnetic form factors. So there are three ob observables that determine the time like form factors the GE, and modu modulus GE, modulus GM, and, and the phase between them. And this uh, polar, this phase gives the polarization of the final state, even if the initial state is unpolarized. And in fact, the polarization arises from a um, triplet S, triplet D interference of the final state particles. These are the only quantum numbers that are allowed. And this has been measured at best, E plus, E minus, quarter lambda, lambda bar. Uh, and it's straightforward. Uh, polarization you measure in exactly the same way as a measure for PP bar. But in the, in, in the one photon exchange model, you have a closed expression for the polarization. So this is a scattering angle, and this is the phase, and this is the ratio R between G and GM. And this you get from the angular distribution. So then you can uh, measure polarization, which gives you the modulus of, of the phase. But you also measure the spin correlation, which is actually you replace this sine term between to the cosine term here of, of the phase. And that also gives you the sine of, of, of the phase. So you can actually make a complete determination of, of the lambda time like form factor in that way. And Since we have a tradition of lambda, lambda bar in Uppsala, we took a closer look to this. And uh, Jordan Felt and Andre Kurt realized that you can, normally you integrate over, over the phi angle of, of the decay particle in the rest frame. But if you don't do that, you can actually do a event by event fit by, 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 uh, to, to this expression and do a maximum likelihood fit. And the beauty of this method is that you don't need any acceptance corrections. They, they are varied in, in, in an overall normalization factor here. So this has been applied for uh, E plus E minus uh, goes to E J psi, who decays into lambda lambda bar. So here you see the angular distribution. This is, this is previous result, uh, published result. But we applied this uh, method uh, on, 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 uh, on the data sample, and it's huge data samples, 400,000 events of lambda lambda bar decaying into charged particles, and uh, some 50,000 events where you have lambda bar decays into the neutral channel, n bar pi zero. And you do a uh, global fit, and here you see the invariant masses of, of uh, the, the proton pi on n, n bar pi zero. It's a beautiful fit. And so the, the function you, you fit is, is the following, which I showed. So the first term here gives you the d differential cross-section, or the R, the ratio between electric and magnetic. This term gives you polarization, and this term gives you spin correlations. And this is the results of the fit to, to the data. So you see, you can determine the phase between the GE and GM to precision of the, of the order of one degree. And this has never been measured before at all, this phase. And uh, another thing is that uh, you, since there are many data, you can also measure this CP asymmetry, which I showed you before, to a better precision that uh, was done before. 
And, uh, but uh, the interesting part uh, I will sh show here. Of course, this is a direct measurement. You also fit the asymmetry parameters, and it's a direct uh, measurement. And this uh, came as uh, an eye opener for me, at least, uh, that we measure the lambda decay asymmetry parameter to be 0 0.75 plus minus 0.09. PDG value is 0.642. So it's a more than a five sigma difference between the, the best three value and, and, and the PDG value for the asymmetry parameter. And there's also the asymmetry parameter for the neutral decay should be the same as for uh, the charge decay if uh, you have asymmetry, a IC spin asymmetry. So what, does, what impact does, does uh, the, this asymmetry parameter measurement have? Well, it has actually an impact on all of what I said earlier, because all published data on lambda and sigma zero polarization must be renormalized according to this. So they are 17% lower than have been published, if, if this is correct. And secondly, that the decay asymmetry parameters uh, for the heavier hyperons are not independently measured. They are measured as the product of the lambda decay asymmetry parameter and the asymmetry parameter of the heavier, uh, heavier uh, hyperons. So all this has to be revised accordingly in the, in the PDG. So then you ask, why, why do we trust this uh, measurement and not the PDG? Well, the earlier measurements were indirect measurements. This is direct measurement. They, they, what the other experiments did was they measure the polarization of the decay proton. In, in a, they had a slab of carbon and, and measured the left-right uh, scattering of that. And these are experiments that was done uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, long before you had Xi'an simulations, etc. And, and we have been contacting those people who did this and say that we are not surprised because uh, they didn't uh, do a careful job on, on the systematic uncertainties. So this is now in, in the final, final uh, editorial fixing uh, for a nature paper. Um, last topic, a few words on, on spectroscopy. Because un, un, understanding the barium spectrum is also equal in a sense to understanding the strong QCD. Because there are many unknowns uh, still there. The level ordering, ordering of the spectra is not understood. And there are more states predicted uh, by theory than observed or, or the other way around. And what are the relevant degrees of freedom? I mean, uh, do you have a three quark system? Do you have a quark, di quark quark system? Or are they, you have rather dynamically generated uh, systems, uh, um, like a molecular system? And you can also test the lattice QCD. And very little, is in particular on, on, on the strange hyperons and double strange hyperons, very little is known. Now, where are the octet uh, partners of the n stars? I mean, this is the P PDG, the, just question marks all over the place. And for the decoplet members, nothing is known uh, about, about uh, apart from the, the ground state uh, hyperon. And I find it a bit amusing. This is a PDG 2018. They say that. Not, not much is known about the uh, cascade resonance. This is because they cannot, can only be produced as part of the final state. So the analysis is more complicated than if direct formation were possible. Well, that's exactly what you can do with the PP bar. You can produce them as in pair directly. So it, it's a game changer. Um, the final cross-section uh, cross are small, typically a few microbonds. Oh, that's fine, no problem. And the topology complicated, difficult to study with electronic techniques. Well, I think this must be a leftover from a statement done uh, 
from 20 years ago who would detect her like panda. I mean, this is, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's peanut, uh, a piece of cake, but it's certainly doable, easy, relatively easy. Another amusing fact uh, people don't realize is that the parity of all these states, ground states has never been measured. They, they are simply assumed according to the quark model, just the slide remark. So what I want to convey here is that you, you can not, not only do very good precise on, on the ground state uh, hyperons and uh, look at spin degrees of freedom. They are, P bar P is also excellent entrance channel to, for hyperon spectroscopy because you have strong interaction process, high cross sections, barium number zero, so you don't need, to, you can use all the energy available to produce the, the excited uh, hyperons. And you have to see the same pattern in, in the particle and antiparticle channels. So you have consistency checks also. And uh, at, at Lear, or Lear, at, at uh, Panda, you, are, you have um, accessible up to uh, excited states uh, up to uh, all the order of 3 GeV, so cascade, uh, Sean cascades. And there has been one feasibility study just to look at for cascade 8 and 20. And uh, assuming one microbarn cross-section, which is uh, quite reasonable, the result is that you, you could produce something like 15,000 rec reconstructed, reconstructable events uh, exclusive. And that is, all final state particles detected per day. So again, panda. <laughs> and of course, the cross-section for the excited hyperons are expected to be this, of the same order uh, as the ground state, so there will be plentiful of uh, uh, data coming also for uh, spectroscopy purposes. And that brings me to uh, this slide. So this is uh, the wind of opportunity for Panda for, for hyperons. Layer, which uh, I showed the result from, had this window of opportunity. So it is really a window of opportunity to, for, for hyperon physics in, in Panda. And that, by that I would like to conclude that the, the prospects of hyperon physics and electromagnetic physics with Panda from the very first day are very good. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you for this very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, broad talk. Yeah, yes, it thank was you. even broader than I anticipated two days <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, but very good. Uh, questions? Uh, hi. Uh, you show some results for the proton form factors in time like mm -hmm. G and GM. As far as I know, it's possible also to measure the angle, right, for the proton? No. No, no. So no you, 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 in order to do that, you need a polarized target. Uh, I mean, for the PPBAR case, you need a polarized target. And there are ideas to put, uh, put a polarized target in, into Panda to, to measure, measure this okay. phase. But this is not for day one. This is, this is for uh, later on. But so there, there are ideas. My question was the following. So right now, the, the only for Lambda, we have the full information to, to, to determine the... Yes. Uh, is this because of this, it is easy to measure this polarization alpha? Is this a question of precision, precision or is something else? No, 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 uh, you, is it possible to measure in the future like uh, some of the stigmas or something? Or lambda is special? Well, the point is that um, you need statistics. And the cross sections are, are low. So... Um, it's a question of time and, and priority for the experiment. I mean, we have now, in, uh, I didn't show that, we had measured uh, the phase, uh, not f only from the Yates side, but also closer to the threshold, and, uh, which gives you, uh, uh, which is now up to, uh, for the final internal review, where the phases with much larger error 
compatible with uh, the, the phase was measured from the psi. But th these data um, consist of 400 events, and that took uh, three weeks of, of beam time uh, at best. And, and uh, there's, there's a lot of struggle to, you need time because the cross section is very low, simply. You, you mentioned that the, the meson exchange models for yeah. PP bar, lambda, lambda bar needed the exchange of this tensor meson yeah. to, to match the data. I, I just wondered, is that a potential mechanism, how the spin can be transferred from the proton to the lambda bar? Has that ever been, been looked at? Because you also mentioned the spin correlations, right? Yeah. Well, uh, my head is too empty for the moment, to, but um, I, I don't see easy. To me, this should be symmetric mm -hmm. somehow, naively. So, well, why would you have a transfer from the proton to the anti-lambda and uh, not the uh, proton? Yeah, but it, that process is important, right? That, that process obviously transverse yeah. angular momentum from yeah. one to Correct. the other. That, that might be the measurement. Yeah. I, I don't know. But then you should also tra transfer the other way, but, which is not. <laughs> okay. yeah. More questions? So you had a criticism about the PP bar going to lambda, initial and final state interactions, mm -hmm. because these are not known experimentally, no. right? But isn't that in, in, in heavy ion collisions, through femtoscopy, when you measure the correlation functions, then you get uh, this is very recent, I, I understand. People are measuring, say, the lambda lambda bar as a final state interaction. Uh, I, you can energy. probably get some information, but I, I don't think you can pin down the spin dependence of the interaction by that. Yeah, probably you have to you, measure the spin. Yeah, but. Um, True correlation. happening in the last two or three years, yeah. right? This, this yeah. using... Uh, uh, well, one, one, one interesting part, uh, I didn't maybe said that too, the polarization or from, from the um, E plus E minus go to lambda lambda bar, that is given by the interference on, of, uh, of uh, S and D waves only. And this, this uh, interference should also be reproduced by the the models that uh, use PP bar because the final state is the same. So this is the filter to pin down that part of, of the final state interaction in fact for this partial wave, specific partial wave. I have a question. It's about these oscillations in yeah. proton in these uh, time-like uh, proton form factors. What is the, I mean, is related to resonance as vector meson resonance? Or, or there are some more deep uh, um, views on that? I knew the answer um, uh, six months ago, and I realized I, I should catch up before I gave this talk. But I, it, I know that um, Eagle and company, they, they relate this to an interference term somehow. But there is also some, another interpretation of, of, of some reflection of, of resonance. But uh, I apologize. I, I didn't catch up on, on, on this because I got the slides uh, yesterday afternoon. So, <laughs> but, uh, but it's intriguing. Yeah, what was yeah. surprising is, is, is that uh, the Barbar collaboration didn't, observe, didn't uh, scrutinize data carefully enough to realize that there was this oscillation. And I can disclose that, that much that uh, similar things are seen about, uh, at the uh, best also. So this seems to be a real effect. Okay. No, no, no. In, in the, I mean, uh, in the kinematical region where you have PP bar, you have these oscillations once you subtract a kind of background. Yeah, they, 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 yes. they do some dipole yeah. effects uh, and yes. then they subtract the. So this. Maybe it will appear in production of other others there. Mm -hmm. Okay, some more questions? So let us thank uh, our speakers. So we are back at.
three. three. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. The first time yeah. that is very amazing. Yeah, I it thought it could be related to resonances. Because there is. Yeah, no, but the, the, there is a, a reference uh, in, in, in uh, Frank's papers uh, to, to a paper discussing this in terms of resonances. Ah, uh, okay. I will, I, I, I will upload uh, so you can have a look. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>